We are getting ready to board the Alaska Railroad Wilderness Express train to Denali. We are at the Alaska Railroad train depot. Got the baggage tent over there. They have a coffee bar inside. They said you can visit while you wait. Oh, you heard that? That's because the Denali Depot is inside the park. Wilderness Express. Can't wait sleepy head up to take in any news. Can't get sleepy head up to look at the news. So if you're familiar with Queen Anne's Place and you've seen something that looks similar out there, that's our cow parsnip. One member off of the plant, we have about six weeks until the first snowfall. That's the old wives' tale. And it's really not too far off. Okay, now we're going through the Birchwood Rail Yard. You can see on our right, this is an area where they stage construction projects for Alaska Railroad. All the wooden ties, the metal rails, they'll be coming in and out through here as they're being replaced along the tracks. We'll also be able to look through the left here and see the Birchwood Airport. You can just start seeing it through the trees. Um, lots of small aircraft that fly in and out of here. And I like pointing out because it is small aircraft like this that really service a big portion of our state. Many communities are completely off the road grid. Yeah, many communities all around. <laughs> The peaks are a bit in the clouds today, but everything on our right here, we're looking at the Chugach Mountain Range. Uh, the Chugach Mountain Range, or the, the mountain range that surrounds Anchorage, they're about 250 miles long in total. And the Chugach are actually the snowiest mountain range in all of Alaska. So even though we have mountains farther north, because the Chugach hug the south central coast, they pick up a lot of moisture off the ocean, which of course in the winter is deposited as snow. So um, throughout the mountain range, you'll get different averages depending on where you're at. But usually around 300 or 400 inches of snow is about average for most of the Chugach range for a winter season. And the, uh, the snowiest part of the range, which is a little bit east of here in Thompson Pass, their average is more like 600 inches of snow, so about 50 feet of snow in a winter season. It's a pretty incredible amount of snow to witness if you've not been in an area like that. Um, I had one winter where I worked at a hella ski lodge in Thompson Pass, so um, just a remote lodge. We had helicopters that took guests up the mountain every day. And the winter I was there, we had over 660 inches of snowfall that season. So about over 55 feet. It's amazing. And that's not even near their record, which is 998 inches of snow. Also glacially fed, as you can tell by the color of the water. And also these muddy banks. These are all uh, deposited glacial silt, all of that mud there. Uh, but 
uh, being braided is a typical feature of glacial rivers because they're depositing silt along their route, which causes their route to alter a lot over time. So sometimes it breaks apart and comes back together in different parts along its route. Um, if you see it from the air, it, you definitely will see the, the image of the braiding effect that the river will do. When they were driving us to Yellowstone last year, he said, all I heard from the back seat was happy. Wow. <laughs> I was in the front seat driving, so I know oh, this was probably just a little late getting it back in tank for the night. <laughs> I want to say maybe do you see the osprey in there, but it needs to be a little closer for me to turn in that for sure. Yeah, I think I see its head there poking up out of the nest. Yeah. So likely there's a clutch of eggs in there. The osprey nest? Yeah, really good view of the Osprey today. It's a big mess. She thinks it's pretty dandy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> No, you can There's different trees and larger trees. On the left, they're all small, skinny, blasters trees. That is because in this area of Alaska, we have what's called discontinuous permafrost. Uh, essentially, that means some places we have permafrost, some places we don't. If you're unfamiliar with what permafrost is, it's, it's essentially soil that stays frozen throughout the whole year. 
So, um, for example, on the left here, you'll probably have a couple of feet on the surface of the soil that do freeze and thaw with the seasons. Um, that we call the active layer, the, the ground that uh, freezes and thaws throughout the year. But then beneath that, you'll have frozen soil. And frozen soil, that permafrost, is as hard as granite. The trees cannot grow the roots through it, um, so it, it basically is a barrier for them to grow down deep into the soil, and that also stunts their upward growth. So even though some of these spruce trees maybe won't get to more than two or three feet tall, they could still be old trees. They could be over 100 years old. Um, for the really little ones, if they're that old, you'll probably need a microscope to count all the rings in the tree if you were to cut it down to actually differentiate uh, the years of growth, all of that, but just using cross-country skis instead of a kayak. Um, it's really nice. I've done trips in both summer and winter out through here, uh, multi-day trips where uh, they have a series of public use cabins that you can reserve online. Uh, public use cabins are, are nothing like the, the houses that we see here. They're very small, very basic. They have a couple of wooden bunks that you can lay out your sleeping roll on. No electricity, no indoor plumbing. They'll have an outhouse. Most of them have a wood-burning stove that you can chop wood and put in. Um, but really nice way to Yeah, so Crystal's going to see you. Yeah, so we're just leaving Talkeetna, heading towards Denali, but instead of stopping in Denali today, we have to go a little further and stop at the depot in Keeley, and that is because the Denali Park is still closed because of the fires. <laughs> Which makes sense. It has tons of glacial silt in it, giving it that kind of murky, cloudy color or sandy color, if you will. Um, in fact, any of the names you see in Interior Alaska that ends with the letters N A, um, that N A. And ending to the words does mean river in the Athabascan language. So 
in Talkeetna, for example, we'll see the Chulitna River, um, the Ninana River, Tor, once we get closer to Denali, any of those words that you see that end with N-A refer to the river. services here and everyone would get off the train here to spend the night before getting back on the train the next day to continue their journey. Um, the hotel has burned down and actually in the course of its uh, time in business it burned down four separate times so I had a lot of misfortune at the Curry Hotel um, but it was a very nice hotel especially given the area in the 20s and 30s when it was operational it was kind of the heyday of the hotel uh, it would have been considered a five-star hotel of today's standards. Wow. They had electricity, they had an indoor swimming pool, they had tennis courts, they used to have a, a suspension bridge people could walk across the river on to a ski hill that they had made. So it's actually um, all things considered quite luxurious being out here in the middle of nowhere. Um, like I said, the hotel burned down multiple times. It was rebuilt a couple of those times, but by the fourth time, uh, you know, already at that point, the hotel was starting to lose business because the trains were starting to go faster and people didn't need to stay overnight night in Curry anymore. They could do the journey in one day on the train, especially when they switched from the old steam locomotives to the diesel electric engines, um, similar to the type that we use today. We still use the diesel electric engine today. Um, trains were able to go a lot faster and Curry just kind of fell to the wayside. Most of the buildings that used to be there were actually brought back to the town of Taukina. There's still some old curry houses that are in the town of Taukina today. And most of them just got scrapped. So not a whole lot to see in Curry now, but just kind of an interesting piece of rail history. Um, so they homeschooled their four children, they put in a big garden, and did a lot of hunting and fishing, and um, ran water from the nearby creek up to their cabin in buckets by hand. And they continued living out here until just a couple of years ago. Uh, they decided to move into town and then they just come out to visit the property, but who can blame them? Um, they've lived out here until well into their 80s, and now Clyde is in his early 90s and Mary's in her late 80s, so um, they're trying to get up there. But we often do see people at their property throughout the summer, either you know, their kids, grandkids, or even great grandkids at this point will come out, um, take care of the property, attend to the garden, do any maintenance that's needed. So it's a pretty cool little uh, photo opportunity. We'll pass it pretty quickly. It'll be in about a mile or so on the right hand side. It's a bright blue house, and on their house is painted Sherman City Hall. 
Um, this area of track is called Sherman, and Mary and Clyde Lovell like to joke that they are the mayors of Sherman, the bustling metropolis of Ullman. So um, in the, the next real clearing that we'll see, you'll see the bright blue house. Also on the right, right next to the track, you'll see a little building that says Sherman Train Depot on it. Um, it's pretty cute. But pretty hardy people, it's definitely not a lifestyle that's meant for everyone. We're in the dining room on the Wilderness Express train now, getting ready for lunch. <laughs> Weston's enjoying the scenery. He's looking for the wildlife. He's got his head buried in something down there in his lap. He's falling, I'm sure. Look at these trees. Look way above the trees. You can see like the mountain top. Yeah, he did. It looks like there's holes in the top of that mountain. Uh -uh. Look at the top of that. It's like there's holes up there. See? So, Scott's nephew, and you took the party. Maybe that is. We're going to save something for the next one. We're to make drops. Oh! Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that.
on the right, all the way to the mountains. We can see on the left, filling the cold valley. It would have been about 2,000 feet thick from where we stand, all of ice above our heads. So glaciers tend to move down the hill, slowly sliding through the valleys. And as they do so, they can carve these long, skinny grooves. After the glaciers are seeded at the end of that ice age, some of those grooves filled with water, like we see on our right, and created the lakes of this area. Uh, geologically, we typically call them. There goes that Ge Geologically, we typically call them kettle lakes or kettle ponds. And if you view them from the sky, they really do look like these long scratches on the landscape. You can really kind of visualize how the glacier moves through this area. Currently, we are in the town of Cantwell, and if you actually look on the left as well, you can actually see the runway for the airport here. So you can see the, the windsock on that one hanger kind of to our left there, and then this grassy area with the lines with the traffic cones is where the planes take off and land. <laughs> I don't know if I want to fly out of that airport. <laughs> Oh, sorry. It's so good, baby. Yeah. Oh, my. All right, so here's those uh, gold star cars of the Alaska Railroad. And then after their gold star cars, we'll see their single level adventure class. At the very end of their train, we also have two Wilderness Express cars, like the ones that we're in here. So Wilderness Express is a separate company than Alaska Railroad. We are Alaska owned and operated. We have four cars in total in our fleet, uh, two on this train and two on our sister train just across. So when the Alaska Railroad does run year round passenger service, Wilderness Express is just seasonal from about mid-May to mid-September. We'll probably start stop just short of the um, well, other Wilderness Express cars here, and that's where the other exchange will happen of different staff and supplies going back and forth. If you're able to look just forward here on our right, you can see a couple of the conductors on the ground, and uh, a little bit of activity will start going back and forth here. Who's the the I the <laughs> All right, and then once our trains get going again, we will engage in the Wilderness Express tradition of the moose wave. Um, so I always like having the most moose on my car, but if you want to participate in the moose wave, that's a hand on either side of your head as your antlers wiggling your fingers. I bet we'll see some moose over there too, but we have to at least pretend like we're having more fun than them. <laughs> 
are like as we go through the park area so it's not too far ahead of us here we do actually enter into Denali National Park and then once we get past the Denali Depot we do go by an area that was on fire last week we haven't seen any actual flames or anything from the train um, in several days now but you will see the first area and I'm not sure exactly what the speed restrictions are like there today so we'll kind of see how we go along and I'll keep you updated but right now I'd say so 4.30 seems like a reasonable guess to be getting to Healy. side you'll see a uh, series of structures up there that is all part of Windy Lime Mine so they mine lime out of that hillside there um, so on this side of the river we're in Denali National Park but on the other side of the river that's outside the park uh, the river is the boundary in this area um, shortly we'll see the Nanana River over on our right hand side 
So while they have natural resources all over the state, you definitely see a higher concentration of mining activity along the rail and highway, since that would be a way to get those resources out of the wilderness again. And you'll be able to see just down the hill from the, the mine is the Parks Highway, so it's just on the other side of the river as well. We're turning more into the Alaska mountain range now, so we're leaving the Talkeetna Mountains behind. Um, the mountain that's directly on our right here, the summit is just in the clouds, uh, but not too much farther up above the clouds, you would have the summit, it's called Panorama Peak. And the summit of that is just about 6,000 foot in elevation. And we're at just below, uh, just below 2,000 feet in elevation here. So you got a good 4,000 foot rise on the mountain just to our, just to our right side. There's something that goes along the bottom. Notice looking at the Nanana River that it's doing something a little bit different than most of the other rivers we've seen so far today. And that's that it's actually flowing north, so it's flowing in the direction that we're traveling. And earlier today, the Susitna and all the other rivers, they've actually been flowing south. So when we came over the summit of the rail, we also crossed the watershed divide. So earlier, before we crossed over the summit, we were in the Susitna water shed and now we're in the Yukon River watershed. So the Nanana River here has a long way to go until uh, this water would actually reach the ocean. Uh, first Nanana has to go a couple hundred miles north yet, meet up with the Tanana River. The Tanana will flow into the Yukon River. The Yukon is, is a huge river, the biggest one in Alaska that actually starts in the Yukon territory of Canada flows north past Whitehorse, up past Dawson City, crosses into Alaska, goes above the Arctic Circle, goes back south of the Arctic Circle, and then empties out in southwest Alaska at the Bering Sea. So that's eventually where this water will end up as well. Apparently it's been kind of a homespun project and once in a while you'll see like some work has been done on it but I don't think they've ever actually generated any electricity. Um, they are connected to the power grid here though so um, it's not like they're without electricity here. And again they're just outside of the park on the other side of the Nanana River there and we're inside the park here so you wouldn't see development quite like this within the national park boundaries. All right, folks, and Carlo is going to be fine due to our last call. So it's just going to be our last call for alcohol, gift shop items, anything you wish to purchase today. Now is the time to do it if you are getting off in 
finale slash Gilly, where we're actually dropping our boots. I'll be coming to you. Anything else for y'all? All good. I'll send it over here. I'll send it. I'll send it. I'll send it over here. I'm looking to see a lot of the hotels for the park area as well. I'll kind of point out where those are at as we pass them. And we'll also get to see um, part of the area um, that is part of the current burn area for Denali for the Ryan fire. Um, now, the past few times we've been through on the train, I haven't noticed any uh, smoke that we can see from the train or smell any smoke. They still say the fire is only about 30% contained, but it's more heading in a direction that's away from infrastructure. So um, that is good news. But we will get to see a part of an area where it crosses the tracks. Um, after we go through the Denali Depot and the hotel area. So here's Riley Creek Bridge here. Get some nice views on both sides. And now we're entering uh, the Donali Station. Uh, the depot we'll see on the left. I don't imagine that will stop at all unless there's any fire crews that we're transporting. Uh, but I do not believe we are, but always a chance we might make a quick stop and then we'll continue on through. That's if you want to go. There's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, go to get down. Yeah. Food and all that stuff. The other, which is closer to where you would want to be, Bangor. Yeah. And that is a shorter trip over to the MPI and Katie. Yeah, one stored up there. On the right hand side, we can see some of the helicopter aircraft. Um, these would have been used for dropping water um, onto the fire area. Firefighters in the house. There you go. Which guy? Butter or man? Both. Oh. Oh, there's one that says Alaska. <laughs> I bet Wednesday, and then I, I bet we leave out of this because it reopens Wednesday. I am Um, everything that we'll see on the right will be just outside of the park. Again, on this side of the river, we are in the park, um, but we can see some of the, the supporting businesses. This is all just seasonal, just May to September. Um, so it's not really truly a town at all. It's everything will be boarded up by the beginning of October. Um, so starting kind of toward the top of the hill there, the building with the green roof, that is the Denali Grand Hotel. Um, just downhill from that, and a little bit to the right, you have the Denali Bluffs. And working 
kind of toward it as you're looking at it more towards the front of the train or to the left. All of the buildings on this side of the highway with red roofs are part of the Denali Princess Lodge. <coughs> And then once you get a little closer down to the river up ahead, you'll have the McKinley Chalet Resort. Let's see, what else? Yeah, there's a crow's nest as well. So if you're looking at the princess property and just go up into the woods a little bit, um, it's pretty small, but that's a couple of the buildings just above the princess property there, so the crow's nest. And then basically all of the other buildings that are right along the highway, just on the other side of the highway, they're just all kind of like a boardwalk strip, about a half mile, three quarter mile long of different shops and restaurants. That's if you look um, directly ahead on the right, you can see some of the burn area there, that kind of black and brown area in the forest is part of the area that was on fire recently. West and look out and see that's where some of it burned. Generally, they don't do anything. Yeah. Well, 
Oh, he's on a steep hill. I wonder if he climbed up there. Okay, and then just depending on what our speed restrictions are moving forward, I would say we have a 30 to 45 minutes left of our journey. Um, it is kind of a bonus for you all because really um, we'll be going through a canyon here that typically that people are getting off in Denali don't get to see. And it is, potential, some would say, the most scenic part along the Alaska Railroad. Um, so we'll be just winding our way along with the Nanana River through this canyon. We'll have really nice views all around. Um, so definitely keep your head on the swivel. There'll be some really nice sights coming up. Thank you. Thank you. I saw that. I wonder if there's a road.
How's it going, everybody? Doing well? Yeah. Good. A little bit of time. Figured I'd come through and see how we're doing before we get into here. Doing all right? Good. Okay. How are you? I'm letting you know there's something else. Yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a fabulous the river you might have noticed there's uh there is some white water down there and people definitely do raft the Nanana River through this area um depending on the water levels the rapids can be class kind of two and three or if it's a bigger water day even more like three and four class rapids through the canyon <laughs> lines that they drill the explosives down into the mountain to blast it out uh, just along the rock face right here on the left. And we'll get one last really nice curve in the train starting now where the train is curving around to the right. So if you're still hoping for a picture of the engine, this will really be your last opportunity to do so because we are getting really close to pulling into Healy. In fact, it's about time for me to start wrapping things up up here. Um, so, we'll be pulling into the Healy Rail Yard shortly. Um, I'm going to be on the ground once we are given the okay to disembark. So, once you're off the train, I'll be down there. I can help point you in the direction if you're looking for a hotel shuttle or your motor coach or whatever it is. Um, I can show you where that is. Um, I'll ask that you just hang out up here, though, 
and Austin, your bartender, is going to be the one that lets you know when it's okay to disembark. We'll just get the word from the conductor, we'll relay it to Austin, and he'll let you know that it's okay to go. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to go downstairs and start preparing our car for disembarkation. But I did want to take a moment to thank you all for riding with us today. I hope you had an enjoyable ride, including this little bonus part at the end. It was pretty nice, right? And um, yes, and enjoy your time in Alaska and the rest of your vacation. So we definitely appreciate everyone that comes our way on Wilderness Express. We're an Alaska-owned and operated company, so whether you booked with us independently or your tour operator booked with us, uh, we just appreciate everyone that comes and rides the rails with us. So again, thanks again. Wait for Austin to give you the okay, and I'll see you down on the ground once you're given the cue to go. Thanks a bunch, everyone. She works super, super hard even in her free time. Learn more about Alaska to teach you fine folks everything she knows. Like we said earlier, give her a big thank you on your way out. And I will also ask if I can get a big, they can't hear you downstairs, our kitchen and waste shop, but they can't hear you stop so we can get a nice Alaskan earthquake and all the earthquake downstairs. Yeah, that scared them nice and good. <laughs> We're going to be driving shortly, everybody.